Welcome, my name is Dimitri Broxton. I'm the Senior Director of Education at Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. And this is in the artist studio. So Maud's building is still closed due to the mandatory shelter in place. We plan to open by fall at the, at the latest, ho hopefully late summer. Um, but in the meantime, you can still get your fill of art and artists of the African diaspora. So twice a month, you can join myself or my colleague Elena Gross as we visit some of our favorite arti artists in their studios to see what they're currently working on. This is a rare opportunity to hear from artists directly from their studios. And just to remind you, we follow all of our talks with an audience Q&A. So uh, as we're going along, please, if you're on Zoom, drop down to the Q&A tab and enter your questions and we will get to them at the end. If you're joining us on Facebook, also enter your questions and Sade, who is with us, will bring your questions over. Um, so you will be included. Please visit our, our website to see which artists we have coming up. And you can also go back to Moad's Facebook page and also our YouTube page to see all of our past talks. The series was made possible by a generous donation by the West, West Ridge Foundation. I can't talk today. <laughs> <laughs> all of our MOAD members and all of you who also contribute to the program, thank you so much. We couldn't do it without you. Before we deep dive into the conversation, I'm going to read some statements um, and then follow that with Mario's bio before we jump into the conversation. So first, our Black Lives Matter statement. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless, senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Dante Wright, and most recently, Micaiah Bryant. We mourn all who have lost their lives at the hands of police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. We want to acknowledge that Moad's commitment to racial justice is ongoing, and as such, we will continue to say their names, to hold space and honor these victims. We want to recognize that while we are relieved at yesterday's verdict, it is but one small step towards achieving true justice. We're still reeling from the news that while we awaited yesterday's verdict, a young Black woman lost her lives at the hand of a police officer. And so the struggle for Black lives continues. Okay, and we also want to start off with a land acknowledgement. So as many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples whose lands we are located. It is with deep respect that Moad acknowledges that even in our virtual space, our people, our work, and our network servers are on native lands. And we thank the indigenous peoples of the Bay Area and also in Detroit who have stewarded, stewarded this land through the generations. My guest today is Mario Moore. He lives and works in Detroit, Michigan and received a BFA in illustration from the College for Creative Studios, or Studies, sorry, 2009, and an MFA in painting from the Yale School of Art in 2013. He was recently awarded the prestigious Princeton Hodder Fellowship at Princeton University and has participated as an artist in residence at Knox College, Fountainhead Residency, and the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation. Moore's work has afforded him many opportunities for multiple exhibitions and featured articles, including the New York Times. His work is in several public and private collections, which include the Detroit Institute of Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and Princeton University Art Museum. Moore's work has been featured in numerous exhibitions, including the Smart Museum, Chicago, the Smithsonian Museum Traveling Sites Exhibition, Xavier University Art Gallery in New Orleans, the Urban Institute of Contemporary Art in Grand Rapids, Michigan, David Klein Gallery in Detroit, and the Jeffrey Deitch uh, Gallery in New York. He will have a solo survey exhibition at the Charles H. Wright Museum in Detroit in 2021. Can't wait to see it. Today's program is co-presented by Friends Indeed Gallery in San Francisco, where, where Mario will also have an upcoming show in 2021. Mario, thank you for joining me today and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a wonderful intro. Really, really appreciate it. And, and I'm happy to be here for sure. Yeah, so, 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 so am I. When you accepted my invitation, I was like, yes, oh my gosh, score. Um, because yeah, you are someone whose art I, I have been following for a while. Um, your art has been very public, I think, 
uh, pre pretty rapidly, um, even during your, your uh, while you were in your MFA program. And I think there's a quality to your art um, that's accessible to so many people, um, but the content is so deep. And so I'm like, I'm really excited to, to deep dive into this with you. Um, you know, I kind of want to start off with, you know, how have things been with been for you, you know, check in yesterday was intense for all of us. Um, this last year has been intense. How has it been going for you? Um, well, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's everything has been so intense. Yeah, it's just, it's just, you know, it's like, it's like a stack of books, they just keep piling up, right? It's, it's one on top of the other. I think, you know, with COVID, um, all the deaths, um, you know, last year, my, my grandfather passed away from COVID, um, you know, so dealing with those things. And, and of course, the, the constant killing of, of Black people uh, in America, whether it's, it's from cops or, you know, want to be cop or, you know, whatever you want to name it, um, those mm. things kind of pile up. And, and I always like to think of my studio space and my practice as a, as a kind of space of peace you know, where I can put things together, unpack things and kind of consider things. I think in the beginning of COVID, um, luckily I was, I was living in New Jersey at that time um, when COVID just started and my studio was in kind of this um, small business complex. So I, I had my own door and I was right next to the entrance. So it wasn't a lot of people that were, that were coming and going into my space, it was only me. So I felt comfortable going there and I was still doing it, but it, it, um, it definitely got sparsed out. You know, uh, it was it was a little harder <laughs> um, even to just uh, mentally kind of get mm. into the space of, of creating. Um, so a lot of times and, and I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that if you get into the studio, it's a good day. Even if you're going and you just go there and sit or if you go and you sweep in, like <laughs> whatever, gets you to that <laughs> place, it's a good day. Um, so a lot of times I would go to my studio like during the beginning and I wouldn't do anything. I would literally just sit there. I might clean up, I might sweep, um, but it was it was just, you know, it was deadening to think about something that our grandparents have never experienced, right? Um, and my, grand, my grandma is 83 years old. You know, mm. this, this pandemic is new for generations. Um, so to, to think about that and to think about where we are now, I mean, you know, even after the, the kind of the case that went through and, and him being convicted, um, yeah, but, <laughs> you know, like a little moment of celebration, but really this is like the first step, like number one, step number one, right? Um, so I'm still kind of dealing with those things. And at the same time, I have to make work because I have shows coming up. So yeah, it's it's been a little, you know, in and out as far as mentally, what what has mm -hmm. been going on in my, in my workspace. Okay, okay. I mean, I, I completely understand that. And I think, you know, a lot of that situation is, it's common. It's, it's what I hear from artists of having those, you know, moments of, you know, where, where, where you just start, the work is just coming and you're turning it out. And then other moments of, you know, you just have to take a pause, <laughs> you got to give yourself a break, give yourself that time. Um, you know, how, how has, how has this last year impacted, you know, your your ability to get into your studio like have you have you have you maintained access to it and then also like you know what has been the impact on your shows mm, okay so you know i was lucky lucky enough um like i said when i was in new jersey that i didn't my access to my studio wasn't barred right so mm. i had a i had a, a key that led me into the front door and then right into my studio was the next door Right, because it was okay. a small businesses, you know, it might be a business that does printing or I was literally the only artist in that space. Um, so a lot of times, especially during the pandemic, I was the only person in that entire complex because all the other businesses were, were shut down. Um, so my, I, I was blessed. I, I, I didn't have to deal with a situation like, like New York or uh, people trying to get in their studios or uh, kind of a shared building um, where you kind of gotta, gotta work from home. Uh, but what did kind of limit me in that way was I was teaching at Princeton at that time. So I mm. did have to work from home because my internet was in my apartment. So that was very much like, oh, okay, now this is my space now. <laughs> this is where I live, right? This is how I teach my students now. Um, so that was, that was definitely a, a different experience. And then once uh, me, me and my wife now moved to Detroit, 
um, the studio I'm in now, and I'll show you around in a second, is just mine. So there's no oh, limit. Wow. The, the outside is the door, you know, so nobody else is in this building. Um, so, so that's been amazing. That's been great. That is awesome. Um, I, you know, I, I, I always want to get into, you know, an artist pathway. I, I'm again, I'm, I run the education programs and, you know, I, I just think it's, it's always nice for people to understand all the different pathways someone has to becoming a professional artist. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I said at the very beginning, you have an extraordinary mother um, who also is an artist, um, a very, very visible artist. And so, you know, what was your pathway to becoming an artist? And was was that something that was encouraged as, as you know, as you grew up in the house? You know, I know oftentimes when when some, you know, someone is an artist. <laughs> There, there, there's 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 a little bit of like uh babe you're great but uh can you please choose another pathway <laughs> uh for, for your life other than being an artist <laughs> so yeah how how was that for you well you know i was blessed again in that way that um you know my, my father really liked art he couldn't he couldn't make art worth nothing but he he loved art and my mother was an artist so i was always supported um, and this idea of being an artist, right? Um, and I think, you know, for my mom, like my mom tell it, uh, she tells a story where I told somebody, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up. Um, and I was like, I'm already an artist. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, right now, like, what is happening? What is this question about? You know, so it's like, <laughs> I've always uh, felt that way. But at the same time, um, I went to CCS for illustration because I was thinking about money. I was thinking about mm. a job. I was thinking about what I can do with this thing. Um, and I was always looking at my mom, right? A professional artist and she's always worked and she's done both of those things at the same time, amazingly, right? But I was like, I want to, I want to make some money. That's, that's my, so I wasn't thinking, I really wasn't thinking about my work. I was thinking about what's gonna, you know, pay the bills, what's gonna do this, what's gonna do that. Um, and I went into illustration for that, but it became quickly uh, known for me uh, as I'm going through the program. And, I, and of course, I graduated from that program that I didn't like people telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. I made it. And I was like, OK, that's this is this is not this is not the way for me. I really I really like making work and I like making work about what I want to make it about. And, you know, and that wasn't that to me was not about money at all. That was like this is what I actually want to do. Um, so that's what really led me um, into kind of pursuing, you know, art galleries and that kind of mode of, of thinking um, all the way after, uh, after graduating from undergrad. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, so, I mean, you, it sounds like you have been kind of, you've been exposed to art your whole life. You've been making art your whole life. Uh, what was that transition from, you know, the illustration path? Like, did that happen while you were in undergrad, um, your undergrad program, or was that something that you pursued the illustration pathway all the way to the end and then made the switch? No, I, I uh, so I, I definitely pursued it all the way in to the end until 2009, but at the same time, and here's the thing, this is what I talk to my students about when they say they have late assignments or things like that. I was so focused um, in undergrad my junior year, sophomore year, about learning how to paint in oils and those things that I went to study with a friend of my mom's, Richard Lewis, to learn mm. how to oil paint actually in high school. And, you know, I brought that into, you know, my, my practice and that was something I was constantly pursuing. But as I found out while I was in the program at CCS is that the assignments were cool. They were like illustrating a book or doing some kind of spot illustration, but I always made work that was separate from school. So I would be making a painting that was my personal work or whatever, and I will also be doing my school work. So at the same time I'm in this program, I'm always doing something else. And the mm. something else is really, really what I wanna do, but I'm gonna get this degree. Something else is like, that's, that's where my mind is, you know? Um, but I learned so much also from the illustration program that I felt like was really valuable as far as um, understanding drawing, as far as understanding form, those type of things. Uh, really, really helped me a lot. Um, but as far as like considering what to do with my life is after I went from undergrad, I got a job 
actually doing set sculpture because a lot of Hollywood films were being shot in Michigan at that time, like mm. Transformers, actually Batman versus Superman, um, Real Steel with, with Hugh Jackman. I worked on that. Um, there was a, a another movie um, called Red Dawn. It was remakes of the 80 movie. I worked on that. And, you know, that was really great. I was getting paid really well. I was a set sculptor, so I was making fake rocks and big caves and <laughs> all these fake things, you know, that they can walk through safely and, and blow up safely, all that kind of stuff. But the hours were so taxing and I wasn't able to make my work. And that was the moment where I was like, okay, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? Do I want to keep doing these jobs and make my work on the side or do I want to kind of go all in? And um, that was when I decided that I should go to grad school. Like that mm. was like the, the right movement to me. And then also my mom is really successful in Detroit, you know, so I was always known as Sabrina's son, you know, and I, I had to get him <laughs> out of under that shadow, right? And uh, make make space for myself and my work. And, I, and that was the best way for me to do that, yeah. That's incredible. Uh, I also wanna say your, your mother also put into the chat, uh, it was Amiri Baraka who asked you the, the question about, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. She also she also just added that now you are now she is Mario's mom. It's so it, it it switched around. But but so you also had a Mary Baraka in your life. <laughs> <laughs> That's my mom. She would take me to all the lectures. Um, and that was the thing growing up. You know, I had a wonderful mother that took me to everything possible, dealing with art or learning, sitting in a lecture hall, and all she needed to do to make me be quiet was give me a sketchbook, and I would sit there and draw. Wow. You know, and you know, whether we were going to a con whatever it was, he gave me a sketchbook. I wasn't, you know, crying or screaming or whatever. I just sit there and draw. Um, and, and, and that was a great experience. And then I had a grandmother who would take me because uh, she was an education activist in Detroit and she still is uh, mm. dealing with, uh, you know, civil rights and educational rights in Detroit. Um, so she would take me to all the protests, all the marches. So I had that side also where I'm learning about these um, city leaders and uh, and these people that are kind of making moves um, to make progress. Um, so I always had these you know powerful women um, that were around me and, and feeding me intellectually and creatively. That's incredible! Wow. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that. You know, no side that side of your story. I think it's also it's impactful to know that you had that support all along. You had that exposure. Um, you know, because oftentimes it's something, especially artists, shy away from with their parents. But I recently had that conversation with Alison Saar, and mm -hmm. you know, she said that. And so, yeah, hopefully more people encourage their their children and their artistic pursuits. Um, before we move on, I would, I would, you know, you offered to show us your studio. I would love to see yeah. you know, what you've got going on. <laughs> of course, let me see. I'm gonna put you in this contraption I have that allows it to roll around. Brilliant, brilliant. So, um, let's see, I'll, I'll show you I'll show you all this one. This is actually the piece that'll be showing in uh, San, in San Francisco. In your yeah, space. and it's the, 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 the cover photo for uh, Friends Indeed, their gallery for the exhibition. Yeah, yeah, so this, this piece is, um, is titled American Windows and you know, it's, it's dealing with everything that's happening at this moment right now, but it's really about past, present, and future, right? Mm. How those things kind of coincide and what America really is. And, and uh, you know, because I always feel like we're still aiming for the possibility of America. We haven't reached that yet, but we have to deal with the truths of America. Um, and at the same time, a lot of people see this because what's so crazy is this is actually about the kind of uh, standoff, uh, uh, riot kind of thing that happened in the Michigan State Capitol. Mm. <laughs> and, and, you know, and this can also represent the, the federal capital, right? Mm. It, 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 which is crazy to say that, right? To think about one image and seeing the possibilities, that means that something's really wrong here, right? But it's also the, possi the, the, the thing about um, me as a Black man or as a Black person and seeing this history and dealing with it for so long, it's like, okay, I'm used to it now. All right, let me just protect myself and let them keep going on with their craziness. And I'm gonna sit right here with the gun at the side, you mm -hmm. know, if, if necessary, you know? So it's, it's, it's very much, you know, Malcolm X. 
Yes, um, that's exactly the first thing that came to my mind. Yes. Yeah, I went to uh, Malcolm X Academy and I have a, I have a Malcolm X uh, mentality. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me show you this very large piece. Wow, that is incredible. So this is like the scale of it. Wow, <laughs> blown away. <laughs> yeah, so this, this is the um, biggest piece I've ever made so far. And I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a studio space to hold it. Uh, this piece is 17 feet by almost nine feet. It wow. Great reckoning. And again, this is dealing with the past, right? This is about the Civil War, but it's also about what's happening today and us coming back mm -hmm. to the same kind of conversation. So same kind of things. Um, meaning that the Civil War is more like a cold Civil War, something that's never really gotten settled, right? If we kind of consider it in that way, the history of America. Um, but also this white horse, of course, historically, the white horse represents something majestic, uh, majesty, usually as a king, you know, gracing that white horse, or we see the kind of European paintings in that way. Uh, but for me, this white horse represents um, the, the four horsemen. And mm. in the story of the four horsemen, death rides a white horse. I'm also thinking about John Michel Basquiat's uh, famous painting, uh, Riding with Death, right? Mm. There's uh, that, that painting of the skeleton that's kind of riding with skeleton horse. Um, so I'm considering all those things, but this is to represent death itself. So you see kind of the spokes that are sticking out. There's Confederate soldier saddle. Um, the saddle blanket is actually Robert E. Lee's saddle blanket. Oh, wow. Uh, and then a lot of the horses in American history, white horses, were owned by uh, slave hold holders. So Andrew Jackson, favorite battle horse was a white horse. Um, Robert E. Lee's favorite horse was a white horse. Stonewall Jackson um, had a white horse. So it's looking at these kind of two kind of distances with the, the black soldier, black Civil War soldier, saving um, America and in in that possibility of saving the country. And then way in the background, way back here, is it's so hard to see is an American flag. Oh, wow. Wow. So small. It's like this big. Um, but that's that's about, you know, this idea that we haven't reached that horizon yet. We haven't gotten there yet, you know, to, to what freedom in America really, really means. And then I'll just kind of show you around in my space. So, you know, this is kind of the wall space. There's some stretchers over there, books. Let's see. It's about the ceiling height. It's pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, there's this other piece that I'm working on. It's kind of a secret, but I'll share it anyway. Oh, wow. So honored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is a piece of actually me, Titus Kaffar, Mark Gibson, and Jamia Richmond. Uh, you know, kicking it. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's that. And then over here, through that little hallway is my kitchen on the other side of that. I'm going to go around that corner. <laughs> yep. So I'll bring you back over here. Oh, and then this is outside. So actually, let me show you that real quick. Just so everybody can see like what I mean by like, my... my uh, my space is my So like, this is outside. That is incredible. Wow. That's like that's like the big door for uh for shipments, you know, if I need to I need, to, I need something to pick up or something like that. Um, and also, because it just snowed here yesterday in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> that floor was warm. <laughs> and uh, I can enjoy the fresh air. Yep. So, so, so was, a, was a, I mean, other than, you know, Detroit being your home land, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, what was also the ability to have space. Was, was that a, another large decision for, for your move back there? Yeah, yeah, it was it was a lot about, you know, the the possibilities in Detroit and me having a love for Detroit. Also in thinking about COVID right during this pandemic that nobody has ever seen before in our mm -hmm. lifetime. It was about being with my family. Um, yes, yes. Being close to, to those people. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, me and my wife had, a, had, had plans for moving back to Detroit. Um, hers was dealing with uh, film and theater. Um, she oh, wow. Something here, yeah. And, and I wanted to build kind of like an art foundation or something like that for younger artists here. Um, and the only way to do that is like to get, get on the ground running, you know? So yeah, it was definitely thinking about the possibilities, right? That's incredible. That's incredible. And, you know, obviously you just painted the largest painting that, that you said you've ever done. Are you, are you also creating your own stretcher bars and stretching these yourself or <laughs> what's, what's your process behind, you know, uh, the material that you use, you know, the supports for, for your paintings? Yeah. Usually now if I had a wood shop, I would make everything. <laughs> Because uh, 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 when I was in um, New Jersey, I had a wood shop and I was able to make my own stretchers. I'm, a, I'm that kind of artist. I like to make my things because I like it a certain way. Uh, but I was able to get in touch with somebody who makes crates, frames everything here in the city. And he's been helping me out and making all my, my stretchers um, and everything. So that's worked out really, really well. Uh, he makes them like perfect. They're really good. Nice, as far nice. as stretching like this canvas, like, I, I hired my little sister. She's actually uh, in undergrad right now at CCS. And I trained her how to stretch something so big. So I had her work on a small piece. Let me see. I, had her, uh, I was like, all right, you're going to stretch this first. Nice, nice. <laughs> and then um, I taught her how to do that. And then we both stretched the really big one together. That's incredible. All right. So, so is she also a painter? Um, she's uh, more into fiber, uh, but she's an amazing drawer. Like she can really, really draw. But yeah, she's uh, she's kind of a, a fiber and ceramics type of person. Okay, well we're gonna we're gonna uh, keep her on our radar over here. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it coming as a whole family legacy. I, I I absolutely love it. Um, what what I would actually like to do now is to jump into some images. Actually, before I do that, um, I didn't. Actually, I, I have some images that I want to share, but um, at first, I just realized I didn't actually pull any of the silver point, and that's one of the mediums um, that that you work in. And so, I just wanted to talk about silver point, and with the realization, I don't have any of them to show right now. Yeah, let me see. I can. Uh, I'll pull up one really quick if I'm allowed to do that. I think I might. Yeah, do. yeah, you should be able to. So I'll just pull up this one really quick. Um. So th this piece is uh, titled to Toria Turner. So Silver Point um, was always really, really interesting to me. I would you know, go to museums and I would see a Da Vinci drawing or I see a Dura drawing and it would say Silver Point. Mm. And I never had no idea what that meant. I liked the way the drawings looked because they always looked really, really soft. The line was really, really nice. And it, it definitely looked different than graphite in my eye, what I could see. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew nothing about it. And, um, you know, I did some research because I was really interested after I started to do the, the copper pieces about the, about the material that I use. And I, I found out that silver point um, was essentially used before the invention of graphite. So a lot of the, the scribes and people were writing scribes would write with a metal point. Sometimes it would be mm. silver, sometimes gold. Um, and then artists started to use the same material. And then silver point kind of went away uh, after graphite, lead, and, and ink um, came along, and artists gra gravitated more towards that. But essentially, silver point is preparing a piece of paper or whatever you're going to draw on. You paint the surface with a, a, a specific kind of paint, and then you literally take a piece of silver and you can leave a mark with that. Wow! Um, so you're literally leaving behind traces of silver as you create the work. Um, so what became really, really interesting to me in that process was that as I make the work, I'm literally adding value to something, right? The, of course, a piece of paper has a certain value to it, but not a lot, right? Silver has a lot more value. So whether I'm drawing a black man, a black woman, or whatever it is, I'm adding value to the image or to that subject. Um, so specifically for this series of pieces was about um, resting and relaxing. And I wanted to talk about the small moments of rest and relaxation for black men. And mm. I feel like a lot of times that is talking to your significant other, your partner. And um, so this was one of the pieces that I did of, um, 
of, of Brian Turner, actually, uh, brother-in-law now, uh, uh, to his wife. And uh, that's why all the pieces are titled to the other person, not the person in the, in the piece. Yeah. Oh, wow, well, that is incredible. And can you, can you talk more about this, 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 uh, this idea of relaxation and particularly the, you know, black people um, and, and men in particular, um, you know, being and, you know, captured in moments of relaxation. And why is that, why is that significant to you? Yeah, I think it was, it was something that I wasn't thinking about at all. Actually, it was something hmm. I was forced to consider forced to think about because um, at the time, um, in 2017, I had brain surgery because it was, it was from a oh, wow. I had brain surgery um, and I was forced to rest. So literally my body couldn't do much of anything um, as my girlfriend at the time was really helping me do a, do a lot of <laughs> um, everyday tasks, you know? Um, and I started to think like, I, I never, you know, sat down. I never really like took a vacation. I never really kind of just enjoyed my time. I was always in the American idea of work, 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 clock, you know, what, what time is it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I never took a moment to really think about what rest and relaxation means for my body and my mind. And as I started to think more about that, I started to think about historical black men, like, uh, you know, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, W.B. Du Bois, and uh, James Baldwin. And the reality that there was times where they, where they spent, spent with their family, they drank coffee, they, they did whatever their daily morning routine was, they hung out with friends, they even went on vacations. Um, but I, find, I found it incredibly hard to find images of those mm. moments, right? And what I kept running into was the more boisterous kind of moments that we're familiar with, right? Uh, Malcolm X, you know, yelling over the, the microphone, um, uh, Martin Luther King sweating as he's preaching, you know, those are the things that we see as far as images go. And I was like, they had, there had to be these kind of smaller moments mm. and what would those look like? Um, so I started to think about these historical men and also my body at the same time of, of what it meant for me to kind of come back into a full person after relaxing. And so I, I kind of gave that same kind of analysis to these historical men. And, and that's where the silver point drawings came from out of that, out of that time. And there's also a, a kind of nice subtlety to the silver point drawings. So you can see them, but you can also barely see them. Everything's very soft. Mm. So, you know, um, seeing a drawing from far away, you can't really make out what's really going on until you get up close. Um, so it kind of really invites viewers very, very close into, uh, in my mind, with some, something that's personal, you know? Okay. Okay. That's, that's, that's awesome. And so the silver point also was a, I'm imagining that, you know, you, you weren't able to participate in like what we see behind you, this, this very large scale painting that requires the entire body and, and moments of, you know, moving your entire body to, you know, to capture large paint strokes was, was so that was that also kind of part of it, it was something you could do and be a little bit more stationary at the time. Yeah, it it was and it wasn't. And let me okay, uh, okay. Share an image with you to explain why. So <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. I love it. This piece, ah, uh, uh, Jack Johnson. Yeah, this piece is a is a fairly large piece. I think it's like sixty by I don't know forty something for for a silver point drawing. And the one thing I also noticed when I would go to galleries and museums when I saw a silver point drawing, they were always this big, really tiny. Yeah, yeah. You know, really, really tiny things, and I was like, oh, it'd be interesting if I make something big, right? So at the same time that I am supposed to be relaxing, I am supposed to <laughs> considering all these times, my mind is running rampant with ideas. Um, and this was actually the first piece I made after my surgery. Um, wow, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so you can see here, I, I have the scar on my head that's still there. I'm, there's cream that I had to apply. There's swelling on this side of my face. So you can see this mm. inflamed. So, you know, it's about this idea of relaxing but it's also about uh, this historical figure uh, in America who I felt like was was dealt with really wrong because he was a very um, boisterous man. He was he wasn't taking no shit from no one type of guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I can relax because he's doing the work behind me. 
Wow. Wow. There's also, uh, you know, I, I tell people this all the time, but it definitely has to do with the work. If you see somebody with this pose on an album cover, you know it's going to be fire. Okay? Yeah, that's true. Okay. <laughs> <I love> it. <laughs> <laughs> Luther Vandross, <laughs> Michael Jackson, Teddy Pendergrass, they all got this pose, right? So I was using that kind of as, as, as this reference to black men, you know, in this repose where the album is like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. Um, so that was also a, a kind of point for it. But yeah, so I was trying to do something that was more practical for me in my apartment, which was drawing and silver point, but the scale really wasn't that practical. And then as, as time went on a couple months later, then I started doing the really, really small, the smaller ones. Wow. This, this, this leads me right into a question that we got from our friend, Paul Henderson from Facebook. Um, I'll, I'll just read. He says, so grateful for the tour and the review of this amazing work and talented artist. Uh, thank you for Maud for making this possible. He wants to know, is the work available for black collectors and how and where? <laughs> always, all, the work is always available for black collectors. Um, it depends on which work you're talking about first, right? Uh, because a lot of these pieces are going to different places, uh, to different exhibitions, different galleries. Um, some of the work is already sold. Uh, so that's also another kind of a, a specific thing. Um, but if anybody is interested, uh, because I love meeting new collectors, I love uh, black collectors, <laughs> definitely, um, then they can just email me. Um, it, my email is on my website and I can direct them to uh, the gallery where, where the work will be showing. Um, but yes, it's, it's available to everyone. Also another thing to know, because I think this is very important for young collectors, for black collectors who never collected artwork before or know nothing about it. Remember that um, putting something, uh, doing a payment plan is, is an option, okay? Like yes, that yes. is a real thing, okay? So I want everybody to know that because white collectors know about this. Mm -hmm, <laughs> everybody, mm -hmm. does, everybody thinks they just buy it flat out. Payment plans, yes and galleries are open to them. So remember that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for saying that. It's so true, yes, yes. Layaway plans are real. I, I have personally purchased artwork that way. <laughs> so yes, yes, it, <laughs> it is a good way to go about it. And also, you know, so I, I think so supporting, supporting folks that really, you know, their work resonates with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and purchasing, being one of the first people to buy a young artist's work, you know, that can really propel them forward. So thank you. Uh, uh, Sade has put your email address in the, in the chat. And so, yes, I hope Paul will reach out to you. Uh, we love Paul. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start sharing some images because I would love to, to deep dive into some of them. Um, so just give me... One moment, what is going on with this? Oh, wrong side. That always takes me a minute. Uh, sorry about that. And I'm gonna have to get rid of this. Oh, not that part. What did I just do? <laughs> okay, cool. Start. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> All right, perfect, perfect, perfect. All right. So I wanted to I wanted to really take a, a, a an examination of your work, kind of going back as far as I could go back, and I believe this is twenty twelve. Yeah, it is. It it is it is twenty twelve. Um, so yeah, I, you know, we'll, I want to go through these works kind of uh, in like my mindset at the time, and and I can get specific about this, but. At this time um, in 2012, uh, you know, the, the protests on Wall Street was going on. Mm, so that okay. was really, really big, uh, 2011, 2012, um, you know, the, the kind of 1%, 99%. But I was constantly thinking about this, this um, I think, Detroit workers mentality, the idea of industrial business versus Wall Street and the, the economical practice. So way in the background of this painting on the far left, you see like a sunset um, that kind of 
part of the city is actually Detroit that I took from Detroit. Mm, so it's okay. like, like a church, there's a couple of like industrial buildings that you can see. And then all the way to the left in the background that's on fire is, is New York. <laughs> wow, <laughs> wow. It's like the financial kind of, uh, you know, district of the US, right, of America itself. Um, so I was thinking about this concept and idea of what would happen if the masses were to kind of protest and, and raid and, and, and protest on on the wealthy, right? On the on that one percent. So this is that kind of imaginative space, right? I was looking at a lot of different um, artists in history, uh, considering landscape painting, considering uh, little bodies, <laughs> like how you can paint all the little bodies. But there's sure. so many moments in this painting. It's like endless. It's literally endless. There's actually a civil war battle happening in the background. The soldiers. <laughs> that are over to the far right that are like- Oh, wow. Like leading the way with the mass of people. Um, there's a guy who probably owns a house that's up in the balcony that's over to the far left that's running away with a bag of money. You know, it's just, there's just all this stuff going on, right? So it's, it's kind of one of those where's Waldo um, type of pieces, but also looking to uh, historical German painters who did that way before, you know, that, that came about, right? Um, but it's this massive moment of of what I think, right? This workers' mentality um, versus the kind of finance that collapsed, you know, the the kind of economic turmoil that was going on at the time. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And I I mean I, I appreciate all of the the little details in here, and I, I like how you said where's Waldo. It's one of those things where <laughs> you know you really have to look and and see all kinds of things. You know, seeing the fire, I. I, I start to think of, you know, Detroit fires and riots and, you know, and, um, and, and protests. So, you know, it's interesting that, that, you know, you said this is New York. Um, yeah. So it's kind of collapsing these different places. Yeah. And I, I've done that, you know, I do that a couple of times actually in my work in these kind of backgrounds. So I like the idea of spaces and windows and kind of going mm. places. So this was like creating this space that doesn't exist out of these two real places like Detroit and New York and mashing them together to talk about these contracts, right? Between, mm. you know, the kind of work um, it's mentality, the industrial complex, that whole thing. And then the financial district that kind of runs on numbers versus people, right? So it's like putting those things kind of smack dab in the middle. Awesome. This, this piece right here, I, I, you know, I just couldn't help, but, um, be drawn to it, you know, given the what's been happening, you know, lately. And, you know, obviously the first thing that pops into my head is Trayvon Martin and and thinking about the symbolism of the hoodie. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this this was also somewhere around that time, right? 2012, 2013? This was uh, probably 2015. Okay, okay, okay. 2015, somewhere around there, yeah. Um, and I believe the title is red, gold, and, or red, black, and green, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. So it, it might be actually 2016. Um, but so yeah, the title of this piece is red, black, and green armor. And I was thinking about the, the idea of, you know, just clothes and comfortability and, and mm. how when that parchment of clothes, right, is on a different body, Mm -hmm. how that clothing is viewed, right? Um, it's also this idea that I wear a hoodie because I actually have one right now, because it's something that's really, really comfortable, right? It's soft, mm -hmm. keeps me warm, it's cold outside. But at the same time, if I don't wanna be bothered with anybody, I can also kind of cover myself up, close myself in, right? And feel a certain sense in my mind and my eyes, a sense of protection, right? In view of, of kind of many people, um, hoodies are used for uh, working out. It's something mm -hmm. that you do to make sure you, you know, you get your sweat on if you're running, those kind of things, um, and also keep warm. But I was really thinking about the kind of simple way if uh, you remember as a kid, they used to have the kind of dolls and then the paper, you do the paper dressing on the dolls. My sister had a lot mm. of, them. I would play it with her stuff and, and she'd beat me up. But <laughs> I, would, I remember those moments, right? Um, and, and it became a conversation, can I make these items feel like people, 
feel like they have identities in themselves, right? And if I took my body away from these things of clothes, would the identities of this clothes or individual as I'm, I'm calling them have the same identity, right? And once I put my body next to these clothes, the identity of these clothes change dramatically, right? Mm, so mm. it's really about the kind of symbols of the clothes themselves and also what they mean now that a black man um, with this look is standing next to them, right? With an illusion that eventually he will probably put these items on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's, it, it is a it is a powerful thing. Yeah, the the same exact item of clothing can be put on someone with different skin and have a very different connotation in our popular imagination. I mean, I, I guess individually it's going to vary, but. Yeah, definitely in society, <laughs> it's gonna have a different con connotation. Yeah, I love that. I love that piece. Um, and I'm gonna kind of click click away because I guess we talked a lot at the beginning <laughs> of this. We have 13 minutes before we get to the Q and A portion, so I definitely want to invite our audience members to use the Q and A um, icon at the bottom of your screen to enter your questions, and I promise I will get to them. Facebook folks, also please put your questions in and we will get to them as well. So yeah, going back into relaxation and this piece is huge, isn't it? No, this piece is actually small. Which oh, is it? Okay, okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, and it's meant to be that way. I think the painting is literally like this big. Wow, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, it's meant to be that way to kind of pull the viewer in, right? Like to really, Get the viewer to get really close to kind of come into the smaller smaller piece but um for me I, I made this piece when i was at a residency um in connecticut at the josie event and annie, annie alberts foundation hmm. and you're just in this beautiful environment right everything's just so beautiful and one thing that that i talk about often is when you're driving through these kind of rural suburban areas right where the houses are more spread out you see the white picket fence you see the flags that are kind of hanging, you know, as you're driving down and up and through these kind of towns and cities is that is the majority of America, right? Mm. It's not the large cities, right? Because we, we think about cities in the context of how many million people are living there, not in a sense of what is the space of that city, right? Like, like miles, how many miles is that city of that town? And the majority of Americans, yes, they live in the city, but outside of that, the people who have the most Senate, the, the, the majority of the vote live in those rural areas. And, and I started to think about those spaces and I'm glad you said at the very beginning is that this was an indigenous space before then. Right? This was mm -hmm. owned by, uh, by native people, right? And, and so what gives you the right to take this space and, and to own this space? Because not much of the space has changed in those environments, right? Mm -hmm. And it was this beautiful lake and as I was thinking about rest and relaxation, I was thinking about ownership and what it means as a black person to own land, to own a house, to own anything like that and the possibilities of owning something like that. And, uh, and it was like, well, this is not my space. This is definitely not <laughs> um, a Euro American, uh, American space, right? Um, so, so whose land is this? And is it possible mm. for me one day to get a part of this land, right? Um, but also to put myself smack dab in the middle of this kind of American landscape to say that this is not yours. <laughs> mm. You know, this does not belong to you. Um, and that's just really what the painting's about. Awesome. Well, I want to I wanna talk about, you know, your use of your yourself. Um, you know, you you are a recurring theme <laughs> and <laughs> And, and your work, um, and you know, I, I know artists have historically done this, you know, for centuries at this point. Um, but you know, why? Wh what is the significance um, of you including yourself, and and kind of like what what do you want uh, viewers to to take away from you know the piece that the pieces with your inclusion. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. I don't know if I worded that the way I, no, I wanted it to. It did, uh, <laughs> I think I think on the simplest level, really, it's like it's uh, a, a question of what's possible in my space, what's available to me. I'm always available <laughs> uh, getting people to paint and models. And, and I tend to think about um, my work coming from a very personal perspective, right? 
Mm. And, I, and I say that in a way because I want my work to have a certain earnesty, um, honesty, and and uh, be sincere. And I feel like in order for me to do that, I, I have to meet people and I have to know the people that I'm working with and I'm painting. Even if the painting is not about them and it's about a much bigger subject, I would like to get to know those individuals. Um, mm. So when it comes to working from my perspective, it's really easy because I can talk about a very, very big issue, but something that's really localized to me, right? So in the broader times, I can speak about my dealing with rest and relaxation and having to have brain surgery, but I can also speak about a broader term about medical apartheid and experimentation on black bodies in America, right? I can, it can do, it can do both of these things at the same time. And I feel like it's my way of working from a place of earnesty um, that kind of distributes something that is very personal. And also a question you had in the very beginning is the way that I work where anybody from any level of uh, art into intellectual capabilities can come to the work and have some approach to it. Right? Mm. So it makes it so that it's available. So you almost feel like you're entering into a film or you're, set, you're, you're walking into a space. Um, and that's, that's how I want it to feel. But if you know more about art history, more about American history, you can dive into those hidden stories that you can find, right? Um, so that that's that's really the reason why I use myself um, because, like I said, I feel like I'm I can speak about my body and my experiences, and that also allows me to speak about my friends' experiences, um, my family's experiences, um, and in broader terms, you know, a, a broader people's kind of experience. Mm. Thank you, thank you for that. I you know I I also noticed one kind of an observation is with your inclusion, you're always looking back at the viewer. And, you know, I think I, I think oftentimes, you know, when folks are talking about art and the viewer, especially if if the viewer is black or the subject is black, um, looking back um, is often described as as a confrontation with the viewer. And, and I, I feel like there, there are moments for sure where, where I feel like in some of your pieces, there is a definite uh, confrontation. <laughs> I think I saw one of the silver points where there's a little bit of a scowl, but I think I, I think more often your work is not necessarily. I wouldn't say it as a confrontation to the viewer. It's it's an engagement with the viewer uh, almost. Um, can, can you kind of talk about that 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 connection <laughs> uh, with 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 how you use yourself in, in the work? You know, all of your subjects are are not necessarily looking back. Um, and connecting, you know, eye to eye with the viewer, but you, um, when you include yourself, are always doing that. Yeah, um, I think specifically, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm telling the viewer, um, you know, look at this, find yourself in it, understand the history, and look at this again, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's a, it's a lot about that, right? Because of course, historically, you know, we, we have people like Barclay Hendricks, Carrie Drains Marshall. Um, uh, Kehinde Wiley, who talk about the, the kind of white male gaze, uh, the historical art gaze, right? This idea of that figure in the work kind of representing a people who, who've always been placed in the background, who've always been referenced in art history as subservient to the, you know, the main stage, right? Mm -hmm. what, what's the main stage here? It's usually uh, a white male or a white female that's the main stage of the painting if we're talking about, you know, a two dimensional work. And I think for me, with using myself, um, I'm also making a statement about history, my, my point in this time, right? Like, like a timestamp, like this is here and now. And although a lot of my paintings don't reference, like you can't pinpoint what period it is, mm -hmm. right? especially for this painting, um, because the, some of the references are from the 19th century. Uh, the, the background is, is really bland. The light lamp could be in, kind of any time, right? So there's no kind of, dedicated period. Um, but as an artist who's practicing now, and also an artist who recognizes that my body viewed through America is seen in a very different lens mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. than my family views my body, right? Um, and how my body is seen in different lens in art history. Um, me making a reference to my body and myself is a way to say, I am here, right? Mm. See me, I am here, yeah. I love it. I love it. 
Well, I I want to I want to I want to move on. Also, um, I I I I need two hours for the every <laughs> time. But uh, you know, I think I, I'm really interested in the work that you did as a Hotter Fellows at Princeton, um, and then also the subsequent exhibition of the blue collar African American workers uh, at Princeton University in particular. Um, so I'm gonna jump to one of those images uh, mm -hmm. right now, and then yeah, can you please tell us about you know what in, did this this felt like a little bit of a departure for you um an important departure um but can you tell us about the inspiration uh for this exhibition and i i saw an interview of you talking about this piece so i i'm it, it has quickly become my favorite of the series thank you so much um yeah the approach to this was was different because the approach to my work is usually come up with an idea uh, do a study or something and then you know find the subjects to to make the work and this had to be different because again like i, I like working with people that i know so first mm. and foremost i had to get to know these individuals um i had to know about them they had to know about me and then the work built off of those conversations and that's why this work has kind of a different different tone uh, a different value because there was a lot of collaboration with the people that i worked with and thinking about the inspiration for it, um, you know, my father works at the Detroit Institute of Arts now, and he's worked there mm. for a long time. And one of his first jobs was being a security guard uh, at the DIA. Uh, and now he, he works in the mailroom. And so I had, a, you know, experience in, in college and, and just in life of always talking to the black and brown people that, uh, you know, work at uh, institutions, colleges, uh, whether they're, you know, working in a cafe or they're doing security. Um, those are the people that I talk to, ask how they how they doing, and, and that's usually what got you through. Um, you know, for the most part, a majority white institution. And I think for this painting in particular, like you said, like the figure is not confrontational at all. And the reason mm -hmm. for that is because I want him to feel like he's inviting you in to this space, right? So this space actually exists. It is the Princeton Art Museum, and that is the European Galleries. But the work, ah. the, yeah, the work that's in the space does not exist in that space. So Princeton does not own that work. So it's all, all the work in the space is from black artists. Mm -hmm. So the uh, uh, sculpture that's behind him is, you know, mm -hmm. um, from the Congo, from, you know, from, a, from, from Nigeria, from the black artists. Um, the Barclay Hendrix is on the left. Uh, you can only see a portion of it, but Barclay Hendrix and then um, Henry Asua Tanner, it's kind of smack dab in the center. That's a painting mm -hmm. of his father. And then the painting of the woman is a painting that I did um, actually of uh, Jordan Castile, it's kind of way back there. I was like, you know, I should put myself in this whole history. Let me <laughs> let me throw myself in there. And then as Charles White kind of way in the background, the Princeton actually does own that piece. Um, oh, okay, okay. Hanging up, yeah. So it's about really like bringing people into this space that exists, but showing them something that does not, right? That's incredible. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That that's absolutely amazing. Um I'm 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 loving how how you reclaim this space also. Um and then, you know, I'm going to go for a couple more minutes before we get to the questions. I promise. We'll get to the <laughs> Um you know, this piece I, I I had to because I understand that this is now hanging in uh in the um dining services area. Yep. Yep. It's, uh, it's definitely so, you know, and as and now that you know, I make work, for me, it's not about like, who's going to buy it or whatever. It's about the work, you know, so I had no idea. And there was no plan, you know, uh, as my fellowship started, or before my fellowship started that the university was going to buy anything or be interested. Mm. In the fellowship. Um, but it just so happened that um, at, at, at the end of my fellowship, they bought the majority of the work that I made. So the art museum, Princeton Art Museum owns that previous piece you just showed. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, and, and Princeton owns this and it hangs in the dining hall. And I think what's so significant about that is that, that these people work in that dining hall, you know, and, and that's what it's about. And that guy, um, you know, Michael, he works uh, at the museum, you know, like he can now guard his own image, you know. That's a, incredible. A powerful message, you know. Um, but for, for that piece, the, the one you just showed, what was so exciting about this work is that when I showed it to uh, Valeria and Howard, 
Um, I was showing it to them throughout the progress, but when they came to see it when it was done, uh, Kanisha wasn't able to make, make it. She's the person in the middle um, to see it in my studio. Um, they came up and, and said to me, Valerie did, she was like, you have over 80 years in that painting. And I never thought about time in that way. And what she meant by that was the amount of time that all of them worked at Princeton University equated to that amount of time. And Valeria wow. was the person that I painted that worked at Princeton the, the longest. She's worked there for over 40 years, probably 44 years now. Um, but that was it was really important for me to make sure within these paintings that they were the primary subject. There wasn't any students in the background. There wasn't any noise. There was nothing else but them, you know, because it was about them holding their space, right? Because that university is their space. They work there, they've built up that space. And of course, of course, centuries probably of some of their family members as talking to them, yes. they also work that same space. So um, it was about ownership to them of that place, right? of that dining hall, of that museum, um, whatever it was. And then that quote in the background is actually a quote by Toni Morrison, who of course wow. worked, at, worked at Princeton. Oh my gosh, that is wow. I never would have picked that part up. I was trying to figure out, I was like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Toni Morrison, that, that, that's incredible. You know, and, and it also feels like you do so much research um, to, create your, to create your pieces. What what sense of, and I'm going to jump to one that, you know, kind of includes that, like <laughs> what, uh, you know, what is your relationship to archives and researching history as you're, as you're developing your pieces? Um, and, and also kind of what, what is that process? You talked about, you know, kind of sketching the idea out um, and, and sometimes making maybe like a, a quick preliminary painting before you get into the final one. Can you walk through like the the significance of of the research that you do? Yeah, and you know the process is usually like coming up with that idea, whatever that is, and it might be something that I'm reading, it might be something I'm watching, it might be a lived experience, whatever that is, and then turning that into kind of a composition. And I usually do really quick raggedy sketches. They really don't look like much to other people, but they make sense to me. And got then it, I, got it. And I kind of formulate, you know, the the, the kind of painting. Um, and, you know, specifically learning about, I, I'm, a, I'm a history guy. I love history. And my dad is also like that. We used to watch like, uh, you know, a lot of documentaries and stuff together, a lot of war movies and would talk about them and, you know, Westerns and, and those type of things, those like old timey things I'm really interested in. Cause I'm, also, I'm always interested in learning how we got here. Like, how are we here now? Like, you need to understand what was going on then to really understand what's going on now. And um, that, was, that was the kind of importance of this piece and, and kind of the piece behind me is that the show that I'm working on in New Orleans is about the Civil War and it's about the comparisons with what was happening then to what's happening today. Mm. And I'm playing this show before COVID happened. So this was an idea that I had and I already formulated and was supposed to start actually, uh, I was supposed to have the show last year, but everything got pushed back, which has also been really good for me. Um, but before the COVID deaths, so now we're almost at 600,000. Um, mm -hmm. Civil War, the deaths in the Civil War were a total of 600, almost 700,000 people died. Wow, wow. In, in any uh, uh, kind of a, a American war, right? The, the bloodiest and deadliest. and from those histories and from those readings, um, I found out specifically about the Battle of Antietam and how important that is in American history. And for those who don't know, the Battle of Antietam was the battle that gave the Union a slight win, right? Before this battle, um, let's see, over, overseas uh, governments were, were going to be participating with the Confederacy. They were going to legitimize the Confederacy, probably send funding, help them with whatever they needed. Because uh, you know Britain already didn't want America to exist in itself, right? Mm -hmm. So anything mm -hmm. to kind of separate that was was a plus for them. Um, this battle was a slight victory that allowed those foreign powers to be like, okay, we're going to stay away. Um, but it was also the victory that allowed um, Lincoln to announce the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, it was a it was this really significant um, uh, battle that he already had it written, but he wasn't going to deliver it until he need, he had he needed a win. And the kind of win that they received was the, one of the deadliest battles in America, 
<laughs> uh, with a slight victory over the Confederacy that allowed for the Emancipation Proclamation. And this battle to me allows the artist here, a friend of mine, Mark Gibson, to do whatever he wants to do. <laughs> you know, mm. <laughs> to pet his dog, to be in his studio, to make work, to exist, to look at flowers, you know, whatever he wants to do with his time, um, uh, it comes from this kind of moment, you know? That's beautiful. That, that, that's amazing. I absolutely love it. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump because <laughs> I, wanna, I just want to keep going, but I want to, I want to jump to one of the, you know, one of the most recent series, um, and yeah, please tell us about this. And I, I don't know. I have all three of them. I don't know, you know, which order. Um, oh, this is this is um, this is fine. So this work actually came about finding out that my family on my father's side owned a restaurant in Detroit. I never knew about. I, ne I wow. never in all my history. I didn't know that that existed at all. So um, I think a couple of years ago. For Thanksgiving, we went uh, down south. So my, my father's side of the family is from Tennessee. Um, so my grandmother's, like the family home is there. Her sister lives there. And was going through these photos. And I see these photos of my grandma and her sister, everybody really young. And they're working at this restaurant. I'm like, what is this? And she's like, oh, my dad owned a restaurant in Detroit. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Wow. So we go through this whole conversation. I find these amazing images. And they're all in black and white. So I did these series kind of considering what was happening to black businesses in the 50s and the 60s, how they were kind of successful, but then there was a kind of de-escalation and elimination of those businesses from uh, governments in power. Specifically in Detroit, they ran a freeway through a whole community, eliminated mm. a, a lot of uh, businesses, but also how that coincides with what's happening today with the PPP loans and COVID. Um, and a lot of those buildings are empty. Um, a lot of people aren't getting the loans, aren't getting the help that other businesses are. So to me, it's a very similar kind of, um, of course, the circumstances are very different, right? But the, the, what happen, what's happening to the businesses are, same, are the same, are similar. So I'm talking about this past, right? And I'm also talking about this space where what does the restaurant feel like if no bodies are in there? What environment does mm. it have any? Does it mean the same thing? And then what are the possibilities of the future? So this one, and again, they're all taken from black and white photographs. So to find out what the color was for this piece was me having a conversation with my grandma, asking her, hey, what color was the booth? What color were the, the, the kind of the grill? What color was everything? And that's how I filled in the color in this painting. And she was telling me like way in the back, um, how her father made those cabinets and what they looked like. And, you know, so yeah, it was, it was really a piece about um, imagination, collaboration with my grandma, learning about history, also about black owned businesses, how black owned businesses are dealing with the environment right now, how they were dealing with it in the fifties. Um, so yeah. Wow, that's incredible. And then, you know, and then you you you, you did go into black and white in, in some of these instances. Yeah, yeah. So this piece was the, the, the first one. So it, it kind of follows this, this is the first one and then you have the uh, space and then you have the full color one. Um, okay. And it's, and, and all the titles are actually, um, uh, who's the uh, Langston Hughes quotes? So all the titles of the pieces are from are from Langston Hughes. Um, yeah. So this was exactly a, a reference from that exact photograph, and I wanted it to feel archival. I wanted to feel that way, but I also wanted it to feel like a painting, and not I'm mm. not gonna make a a photorealistic thing, you know. Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. the next image is actually taken from the same source photograph. That this one. And I removed okay. all the people. And what I had to do to figure out what was going on behind there was actually have a conversation with my grandma and ask her about that space back there because I couldn't uh, see it. You know, um, yeah. So that's that's where where the where the series kind of came from. That is incredible. I I I love this, and I love knowing that this has to do with you know specifically with family history. Um, that's that's inc that's incredible. Um, <laughs> We, we only have a few more minutes. I don't see any questions pop, popping up right now. I do see one again from Paul on Facebook. Um, and What's I'll just Paul? go ahead and I'll read that one. Um, Paul says, he I love the work and messages in your work that intentionally speaks for Black people. Aside from purchasing the art, what are some of the ways that we can support 
this artist Mario, um, such as making demands of our local museums. Yeah, I want to see your work in a local museum, art spaces. Um, how can we help support him and his work? And then you also spoke about a foundation. So yeah, if you can kind of talk about all of those things. Yeah, um, I would say the the best way I love that idea is talking to the art museums. Um, I think that's a, amazing. Um, I think one of the, the simplest ways, I do have a catalog coming out. Um, oh, I can't I'll wait. Talk about the uh, work that I did at Princeton. Um, so you can actually pre-order that now. Uh, hopefully you can, when, when it comes in, you can get it from your local bookstore. If you want to pre-order now, you can get it off Barnes and Noble, Amazon, or any of those places. Um, the, the title of the book is called The Work of Several Lifetimes. And, and I think what's good about that is you can take that to your museum and say, hey, can we get some of this in here? You know, <laughs> if, you, yes. if you wanted to do that. Um, I also have another catalog coming out that'll probably be out in August that it's about um, the, the kind of majority of my work. I'm having a survey show at the Charles H. Wright Museum here in Detroit. And that'll be a new catalog that's dealing with the, my breadth of work from um, 2010, 2009, all the way up until today. So um, that's also another way that you, you know, you can, you can support my work and, and kind of uh, spread the word if you like. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, you know, I also wanted, and, and uh, today is putting uh, links in the chat. Um, I also want to talk about, you know, what you have going on. This uh, this exhibit, this uh, talk is co-sponsored with Friends Indeed Gallery. And can you tell us about that exhibition? Um, you know your your involvement with this. So so Paul, they, some of his work is coming to San Francisco, so you'll be able to see it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm really excited about that, and it's a it's a group show, so I'll I'll just have this one piece in it. Um, but the other artists are incredible; they're amazing. Um, let's see. Um, the also, work Hank Willis Thomas is one of them. Yeah, Hank Willis Thomas is in the show also. Um, so the work that I'm showing is, you know, dealing with what's happening today in this time, the anxiety about it, um, the, the history of it, uh, where this kind of uh, insurrection space is coming from, where that history comes from, um, how black bodies deal with that thing, you know, that's, that's what I'm kind of adding to the show. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'm super excited about that show. Uh, Mickey at, at Friends uh, indeed is amazing. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really happy to, to work with Mickey. That's amazing. Um, and then, yeah, any anything else that you know, um, anything else that you have coming up that you want us to know about? I mean, I know the the Charles H. Wright exhibition is coming up. Do, do you, is, are the dates already secured for that? Yeah. So uh, the Charles H. Wright Museum exhibition opens in June, and I believe uh, it's June fifth. Um, so if you want to uh, travel, hopefully you travel safely because COVID is still out here, very real. Um, and if you want uh, another option, there's also the New Orleans show that's happening. I'm having a full solo show at the wow. gallery in New Orleans. Um, Which gallery? I'm sorry. I... The Arthur Roger Gallery. Arthur Roger. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Arthur Roger Gallery in New Orleans. And that's in October. And uh, that'll be that'll be really really exciting. I'm super excited for that. I'm super, and I'm definitely excited for my my survey show here uh, at Charles H. Wright. Also, yeah, that's 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 amazing. So you'll kind of be on all fronts. Um, any any last things that that uh, you want us to know about before we uh, before we say goodbye for the day? Um, everybody stay safe. Everybody uh, <laughs> make sure. You are staying healthy out here. It's, it's um, COVID is actually really bad in Michigan right now. Mm. It's the highest in, in America at this moment, as far as the cases. Wow. Um, so wherever you are, because it's a lot of people who think that COVID is over. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Mask up, even if you have a vaccine, mask up, travel safe. Um, yeah, just, just spend time with the people that you love, you know? I love it. I love it. This conversation has been so amazing. Thank you so much for this. I am inspired. I wanted to just keep going. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, you know, uh, I, I, oftentimes if I'm with the artists, like we just, we just hit the very, very tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to talk about. Um, I, I hope that you get to, I don't know, are you planning to come out to San Francisco? I know COVID's going on. I don't know if that's a possibility. 
I would, I would love to. I would love to. Um, I, I plan on uh, trying to make it out to the West Coast for sure within the next couple of months. Um, I hope to make it for the show. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I hope to be able to connect with you. Um, thank you, Sabrina. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. I, I love uh, you've made me laugh several times in the chats right here. <laughs> And uh, Mario, thank you so much. Have a blessed day. And you know, I can't wait to, to see what you continue to do, all the amazing work that you do. Um, and you know, it's just great to meet you. You're such a kind, generous soul. I can't wait to see this foundation uh, launch. Um, you know, just thank you for all the work that you're doing out here. Thank you so much. And thank you, Moat, for inviting me to do this. Um, this is amazing. I love talking to you, Dimitri. This is great. Uh, I, yeah, I feel like we can just keep going forever, but thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for everybody watching. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And then just as a reminder for everyone, this conversation will immediately be available on Museum of the African Diaspora's Facebook channel um, as soon as we end. And then uh, by Friday, it will be on our YouTube channel. So please, um, if you came in later, you can go back and you can watch everything and please share out with everyone. All right, Mario, take care. All right. All right. Blessings.